So this week I'm going to talk about alchemy. Uh, in this video I'm going to go through what you might call the Western alchemical tradition, although it heavily involves contributions from the Middle East. And in the other video uh, we'll go through what you might call the Chinese alchemical tradition, uh, although calling it alchemy might be a bit inaccurate. So, um, the point I'd like to make in these videos is that alchemy is often misunderstood. Uh, it's treated as just kind of chemistry but bad, uh, and I think that's wrong for at least two reasons. First, uh, the point of alchemy was not the same as the point of chemistry. The point of chemistry is just to do chemical reactions and understand the nature of matter, whereas, as we'll see throughout these two videos, the point of alchemy was substantially broader than that. They were doing experiments and such like, but they were also, in some sense, exploring the inner world, exploring the symbolic and the soul. Uh, second, alchemy wasn't that bad. I mean, it didn't probably achieve its ultimate goal of producing gold from lead or uh, immortality or whatever, but it did produce a whole bunch of really important practical results and had uh, in its kind of umbrella a whole bunch of very practical techniques. So it's A, not trying to be the same as chemistry, and B, it's not that bad. Okay. So that's the, that's the overall sort of idea that I'd like to get out of this. Okay, so let's go through some. Um, Alchemy is like a vast, vast subject. I really can't do anything close to a summary of it. Uh, I thought I'd pick out one little bit of alchemical writing and just walk you through it kind of line by line, just to give you the flavor of this. And to do that, I'd like to pick out the writing of uh, this guy, Isaac Newton. So you're probably familiar with Newton from his revolutionizing of physics and optics. He's one of the greatest scientists in history. Uh, but he took alchemy extremely seriously. He wrote something like a million words on alchemy and uh, did a whole bunch of alchemical experiments himself. So what I'd like to do in this video is just take a little snippet from his notebook and just try to explain what's going on in it. Okay, so are you ready? All right, here we go. Okay, so this is from an uh, uh, online archive of Newton's writings and this is a bit from one of his notebooks. So I'll just read this out. Despair not. Seek the source of the liquor of the sages, which contains all that is requisite for the work. Tis hidden under a stone. Strike upon it with the rod of the magical fire, and then will come out of it a clear fountain. Afterwards prepare the king's bath with the blood of the innocents, which is the sulfur of something something, and you shall have the mercury of the sages animated, that is, the grand lunary, our incombustible oil, which congeals in cold like ice and melts in heat like butter, which is the Trevesian's clear fountain and the great alkahest. Okay. Um, sorry, the something something in there is a little blank, which uh, doesn't seem to have been filled out in the original notes. Okay, so I picked this passage semi-randomly by going through Newton's alchemical writings. Uh, it appears to be a transcription of an older alchemical bit of writing called the uh, Six Keys of Exodus, which is a short text on alchemy. Um, in case that passage wasn't immediately clear to you, let me go through it uh, a little bit. Okay. Okay, so. Despair not. Seek the source of the liquor of the sages. Okay, so I, I'll take this line as an opportunity to talk a little bit about the goal of alchemy. Um... So have you ever noticed how you have problems? Um, you got like a bunch of problems. And annoyingly, when you try to solve one of your problems, it often creates other problems. So I'm a bit out of shape. So if I try jogging, um, that might improve my cardio, but then my knees start hurting. It's just a whole mess, right? Life is just this really intertangled mess of problems. Wouldn't it be nice if there was some solution to all of your problems, something that you could do that would solve all of your problems all at once. Um, not to put too fine a point of it, but that's kind of the idea of alchemy, that there is some, there is some procedure or substance or uh, something like that that could solve all of your problems. It would be the sort of perfection of physical matter that you could either uh, drink as a kind of medicine or which would transmute uh, lead into gold, which would certainly solve your financial problems. So, uh, 
seek the source of the liquor of the sages. The liquor of the sages is the kind of goal of the alchemical process. It goes by a bunch of different names. Uh, philosophical gold is one of them. I mean, it's sometimes called the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life. Uh, here it was called the liquor of the sages. Uh, it was understood to be something that could cure all diseases. It could grant immortality. Uh, and ultimately it could transmute base matter base matter being something sort of simple and common, like, you know, they use dirt or, uh, you know, excrement or sometimes lead uh, into gold, the purest and highest substance in this sort of worldview. So uh, gold is great. I mean, there's a good reason why it's picked out as the, the, the incorruptible metal, because it literally never rusts. Like if you've got a piece of gold, it'll never sort of tarnish, it'll never go rusty on you, where practically all other metals will. There's a few others, but gold is the one that sort of stays nice forever. And you can see why that would be a nice metaphor for immortality, incorruptibility, sort of physical perfection. Okay, so what does gold have to do with immortality and health? Um, central to the practice of alchemy, and this is one of the things that makes it quite different than modern chemistry, is that the outer physical process that they're that they're engaging in. So they're doing a bunch of sort of uh, experiments, what looks like sort of chemistry experiments. And when they're doing those experiments, um, there's this idea that the outer work is reflected in a kind of inner work. Um, there's a very famous line from a alchemical text uh, written by uh, Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes thrice blessed, called the Emerald Tablet, um, as above, so below. Okay, and the idea here is that basically the structure of the cosmos, the structure of the universe itself, is reflected in the structure of our inner world. So your psyche or your soul or your just inside your body, whatever you want to call this, the sort of macrocosm, the cosmos, and the microcosm, the inner world. Um, so interpreting this stuff is always a bit tricky, but the popular interpretation of this kind of line and a thread running throughout practically all of the different types of alchemy is that um, when you're doing the alchemical work, you're at once working with the physical matter of the world and with your inner world. So all of the substances that alchemists work with are named in uh, sort of deeply symbolic ways Mercury is like the god, Mercury. Um, so this inner symbolic work is understood to be happening at the same time as the outer physical work, and that these two things sort of reflect each other in a kind of harmony. So uh, gold is the most perfect metal. It's the sort of perfection of the outer world. So this, the search to transform base matter into this most perfect metal is at the the same time understood as a quest to transform your messed up, partial, you know, problem riddled life into something perfected. That is somebody who's completely healthy, both physically and mentally and possibly immortal. So, uh, as above, so below sort of helps us to understand the relationship between trying to turn stuff into gold and trying to come up with this elixir of life, which sound like very different goals, but kind of end up being on a symbolic level, the same project. Okay. Okay. So next line, tis hidden under a stone. So the liquor of the sages is what we're after this, this thing that transforms our bodies and our minds and our lumps of lead into gold. This thing is hidden under a stone. So how do you get this liquor of life? Well, you purify it from base matter like stones. And this is an example of uh, cinnabar. So this is one of the kinds of stones that they would have been working with. Um, people have been doing this kind of thing, purification of sort of spe specific compounds from stones for like a super long time, pretty much as long as we've had uh, civilization. So. Uh, the early evidence of smelting uh, of metals from ores goes back like 6,000 years or something like that. So uh, when you you dig up some ore, that's a, a rock with some metal in it, 
uh, and then you heat it up and then the metal kind of flows out. So the metal's got a lower oiling or melting point than the rest of the rock. The metal will flow out and you get this pure product. Um, you know, people have been good at this for a really long time. The idea of heating to separate out some pure product and that pure product is valuable and in important, that's been common since, like, as far as anybody can remember, I, during the Bronze Age, which started something like 3300 BC, went to about 1200 BC, um, the main sort of like military technology was bronze. That is a combination, it's an alloy of copper and tin. So if you mix copper and so you get some ore for copper ore and tin ore, you smelt them both, so you melt out the metal, and then you combine those two metals into an alloy, you get bronze. And bronze is harder than either tin or copper alone. And if your weapons are made of bronze and your armor is made of bronze and your tools are made of bronze, you've got this enormous kind of military and uh, industrial, well, industry is a bit strong, but you've got this enormous technological advantage over cultures that haven't got this. So um, people have understood for about as long as we've been living in cities that you can do really important stuff by purifying metals, mixing them together in the right proportions, that kind of thing. So I think that this idea of, you know, tis hidden under a stone, that there's secrets in the earth that you can access by process of heating and refining and mixing is as old as cities themselves. Okay, next line. So, strike upon it with the rod of the magical fire and then it will come out, then will come out of it a clear fountain. Okay, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I don't know exactly what this stuff means. Like, uh, there's not a kind of canonical interpretation for every line of this stuff. Uh, so here's my best attempt. Here's my, here's my best guess. And I'm just gonna use this as an opportunity to talk about another of the important kind of alchemical processes, which is distillation. So. Strike upon it with the rod of the magical fire, that is, heat it in just the right way, and out of it will come a clear fountain. That is, out of it will come some pure, uh, valuable substance. And distillate, that describes distillation perfectly. So distillation is this process where you heat something up and uh, in a kind of semi-sealed vessel, and then things with the lowest boiling point will tend to come off of it as a vapor first, and then if you've got a tube that you've cooled somehow, then it will condense in the tube and then you get the distillate coming out. Okay, so that's that's the basic process of distillation and this was hugely important in alchemical practice. Um, distillation was known from as early as about 100 CE. Uh, earliest descriptions come from a alchemist named Mary the Jewess. Uh, so let's just take a Let's take a moment to appreciate the fact that we're talking about a woman scientist in the history of science. Uh, it'll happen one more time in the next video, and that might be it for this whole course. So just take a moment to enjoy the fact that there's a woman showing up. Okay, um, unfortunately very little is known about Mary, uh, sometimes called Maria, sometimes suggested that she might have been the sister of Moses. Um, her work really only survives as quotations from later alchemists, but she explains in detail the construction of stills. Uh, the, these are the tools that you use to do distillation. Uh, the stills that she described wouldn't have been quite good enough to get a kind of clean separation of, for example, alcohol from water. So people have been, just like we've been sort of smelting things since time immemorial, we've been fermenting alcohol since as long as anybody can remember. And, uh, one of the things that you can very usefully distill is alcohol because alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. So it will differentially be collected in the distillation process. These stills wouldn't quite have been good enough to get a clean separation. So you can increase the alcohol content, but you couldn't get like, you know, you can get about maximum 95% pure alcohol by distillation. So Mary's stills would have been really good for separating out, say, you know, the tannins and the sugars from uh, wine and getting a relatively pure type of alcohol. Uh, we have to wait a few hundred more years, so 700 more years, to get to uh, Alkindi, whose 
describes uh, techniques for distillation where you could have gotten pretty pure alcohol. Again, uh, after about 95% alcohol, it will aggressively grab water out of the air. So that's about as concentrated as you can make it without special lab techniques. But Al-Kindi, uh, an Arabic scientist living and working in the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, is the first clear source for distillation te techniques that could have nicely separated water and alcohol. Um, he also pioneered things like distilling herbs. So if you put herbs in the alchemical vessel, you can, sorry, the distillation vessel, um, you can get their essential oils to distill off. Uh, that's the, you can make things like rose water. Um, Alkindi actually wasn't a fan of alchemy. He thought it was a whole bunch of uh, bunkery. Um, but, and that in fact, you can't really turn base matter into gold. So all along, alchemy's had its critics. Um, that certainly didn't stop the alchemists from using Alkindi's improved distillation technology in their experiments. So, um, okay, next line. Afterwards, prepare the king's bath with the blood of the innocents. Okay, um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the king's bath refers to aqua regia, which I briefly mentioned once before in, this, in these lectures. Um, as far as, it's an it's a extremely powerful combination of different acids. As far as anyone can tell, it was ended, uh, invented by another Arabic scientist, Al-Razi. Uh, and Al-Razi came up with this combination of hydrochloric acid and nitric acid. And if you mix those in the right ratio, you can get what's called aqua regia, the king, uh, you know, water of the king. And this stuff is particularly interesting for alchemists because it can dissolve gold. You can, you can use this stuff to dissolve gold, whereas just hydrochloric acid or just nitric acid are not very good for doing that. And one of the ways that people thought you could make gold was by using a little bit of it. So you dissolve a little bit of gold and use it to make something that can make more gold. Interesting, right? Um, I don't know what the blood of the innocents means here. You hope that it's something metaphorical. I hope that it's not the case that Newton was going around looking for virgin blood. Um, I honestly don't know what that one is. Uh, unfortunately, alchemical writing is deeply coded, it's deeply symbolic, and they kind of actively try to keep you from understanding it, unless you're sort of an, an initiate. So, uh, yeah, I'll just leave that one a mystery. Blood of the Innocents. Okay, um, just a fun little note on the history of hydrochloric acid. So I tried to look this up to sort of see where it came from. Uh, here's a, a paper from 1965 saying, Concerning hydrochloric acid, all historians have agreed that we have no clear reference to its preparation in the Middle Ages, and that its discovery was not till the end of the 16th century. But as to when and where the first reference to it, it is, opinions still differ, even today. So this is just a fun little, to return to our notion of Eurocentrism and the kind of development of the history of science. Uh, this was the received view in 1965 that hydrochloric acid wasn't prepared until the 16th century. Um, modern scholars think that hydrochloric acid was, must have been available uh, when they created aqua regia. Uh, and probably it was discovered by another Arabic scientist, uh, Jeber uh, ibn Hayyan, around the year 1800 CE. So a good 800 years before this guy thought it was discovered. Um, so just a, just a fun note about how our views of these things have evolved over time. Okay. And we'll do the last line here. So, and you shall have the mercury of the sages animated. That is the grand lunary, our incombustible oil, which congeals in cold like ice and melts in heat like butter, which is the Trevisian's clear fountain and the great alkahest. Okay. So there you go. If you can do all those steps before... It wasn't clear what those steps were exactly, but if you could do all that stuff, you get the mercury of the sages, the great alkahest, which uh, means the kind of universal solvent, the stuff that can dissolve anything, which will wash away all of your earthly problems, like being sick or poor or that you'll eventually die. Okay. Okay, so really sort of like whirlwind tour through some alchemical techniques and ideas based on this very short passage. Uh, before I wrap this up, I think it's worth thinking about why anybody would believe any of that stuff. Um, because again, one of the points here is that this is not, these people are not 
um, stupid. These people are not um, ignorant. They're actually pretty clever people and they know how to do a lot of stuff. So um, most alchemy, most of the time, wasn't trying to create the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Immortality. Most alchemy, most of the time, was what you might call practical alchemy, a little more down home. Uh, so here's a fun um, recipe for, um, it's, it's an alchemical recipe for a substance that will remove unwanted body hair. Uh, so take four ounces of slaked lime and let it stand all night in a quart of water, and on the morrow boil it in a fire, and there too one ounce powder of arsenic sulfide. Uh, and when you dip a feather in this stuff and all the feathers come off, all the little, uh, then it's ready to go. And then you put that on a few times and that'll, that'll get rid of excess body hair. So, um, so don't do, whatever you do, don't do this. Uh, arsenic sulfide and slaked lime, like lime is a very powerful base and arsenic sulfide is arsenic. So you probably don't want to do this, but I bet it would get rid of your excess body. Like if you want, if you have unwanted body hair, this would probably get rid of it and probably some of the top layers of your skin. Like you, this would, this would not be good for your skin, but, um, this is more typical of the kind of everyday alchemy that people would have been engaged in. Uh, just a short list of other stuff that alchemists would do. You know, they'd make rat poison. They would bleach linen. Um, they'd prepare opium from poppies. Uh, making paints and dyes. Uh, in the 1500s, Paracelsus introduced the technique of alcohol extracting opium, producing laudanum, which is a very effective painkiller. So, you know, this is the kind of daily work of the alchemist. If you had like a alchemist in your village, this is probably the kind of thing that they were that they were engaged in. And you can see that there's really good, I mean, if you're an empirically minded person, you want to see evidence, you want to see results. Well, those rats are either dead or they're not, right? Like, your local alchemist says, I can make rat poison. And it's not a matter of opinion whether the rats are still alive. They're either dead or not. Um, your linen is either bleached or it isn't. Your paints and dyes are either effective or they're not. And opium is a very effective painkiller. Like that's, if, you're, if your local alchemist comes to you and says, I've got this stuff that'll help your pain and it's laudanum, uh, you're gonna believe that this person knows a little something about what they're doing. So everyday practical alchemy kind of builds the reputation of this stuff in a big way, such that, uh, you know, the, the loftier goals might not sound so incomprehensible because they can do a whole bunch of important and practical stuff. Uh, another important and practical thing that alchemists got into was the manipulation of metals. So alchemists got pretty good at making something, you know, they're selling their trade as I can make gold and they got pretty good at making things that looked like gold, or maybe they contained some gold, they looked like gold, but you'd end up with more of it at the end than you started because they were alloying with gold with other things. So um, if you're a monarch, you're either going to have one of two opinions about this somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, either you want to ban this because alchemists are running around making things that look like gold coins that aren't completely gold. Uh, so that's debasing the currency. It makes your coins worth less. Um, or you might think, hey, that sounds great. I want somebody to make my gold go further. So Edward III in the 1300s ordered two alchemists to be brought to him with or without their consent to help him with his gold shortage. Like, okay, guys, I've got some gold. If you can make it look like I got more gold, that sounds good to me. Uh, so, uh, Alchemists were quite adept at with use, using things like mercury, like which will dissolve gold, aqua regia, which will dissolve gold, alloying it with various things. Um, they got pretty good at manipulating metals and making them maybe go further than it than they would have otherwise. Um, there are also really good theoretical reasons for thinking that alchemy could be a real thing. So. Recall this sort of basic four element structure that I talked about before. Uh, each element is a combination of two properties. So this is the basic theory of matter that people are working with. And in this theory of matter, it's pretty clear that you can turn one thing into another thing. So if you change the properties of a thing, you turn it from one element to another. So, okay, you got water. Let's take water. It's got the properties of being cold and wet. 
Okay, so what happens if you heat up water? Well, it requires, it goes from being cold and wet to being hot and wet. Uh, and what what is hot and wet? Well, it's air. What happens when you boil water? Well, it goes up into the air. You turn water into air. So basic transformations like that, or uh, wood, which is mostly made of earth, right? So it's dry and cold, but if you add heat to wood, if you add enough heat to wood, it becomes fire. So now it's dry and hot. So turning wood into fire is another kind of really easily observable transformation of the elements by changing their, one of their properties. So baked into the, the theory of matter that people are working with at this time is the very idea that you can transform one thing into another. Um, so transforming one type of substance into another type of substance by changing its properties fits perfectly well with how they understand the natural world. And the basic understanding of, say, geology fit this as well. So uh, the common belief was that minerals naturally sort of change into one another. So from the readings, Moran says, quote, metals in the earth, when left to themselves, would naturally, over admittedly very long period of time, all tend towards the respective greatest purity and perfection, namely gold or silver, dependent on their constituents. So uh, Moran's describing the kind of theory about how minerals develop in the earth. And the one view of this was that they slow, like things are slowly turning into gold. So the alchemists' belief that they could turn things into gold was by no means doing anything unnatural. It was just sort of helping along this natural process that they believed was already going on in the earth. Okay, so, okay, that was a super brief tour through alchemy. Um, there's lots, lots more that I didn't talk about. There's many different diverse traditions. There's a whole bunch of theoretical stuff we couldn't get to. Um, I'll just close by saying like, you know, during the scientific revolution, all the kind of psycho-spiritual stuff that's in the background, the kind of metaphorical language, the belief of like as, as above, so below, the idea that there's this kind of correspondence between the inner and the outer, all that kind of gets stripped away. But the basic techniques of alchemy get retained. So uh, the ability to work with minerals and uh, metals and uh, acids and all that stuff, all that forms the basis for developing into modern chemistry. But if we can put ourselves in the place of the alchemist, so you've got this belief in the kind of correspondence of the inner world and the universe, you've got this theory of matter where things can be transmuted into each other, uh, I don't think it's hard to see why people would think that this is a worthwhile practice.